Great tie-in to the series there. Hey, if you have your Bibles, uh, open it up to two places. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, and Revelations chapter 7, verses 9 to 10. We're going to look at these two specific places in Scripture to be the framework for our message today. And uh, if you're just joining us, we've been in a series for the past few weeks called One. And the purpose behind this series is because we as a staff have recognized that as a nation and as a state and as a community and even in churches, there's a lot of division within our society and our culture. And this is so not God's heart for you and I. Actually, all throughout Scripture, we see God encouraging his church specifically to do all that we can to maintain unity. And so this idea of one is something that we've been talking about for the past few weeks on how we can still maintain unity within God's church. Because if we're not united in here, um, how can we effectively win the world that God has called us to reach? And so tonight we're going to expand on this idea of one and looking at these two particular scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 says this. <clears throat> I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Apostle Paul encouraging the church in Corinth. And he says this. To live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Revelations chapter 7, verse 9 and 10 um, says this. This is the Ap Apostle John giving us a picture into really what eternity in heaven is going to look like. And God was giving him some visions <clears throat> of what that will be. And so he wrote, he wrote it down to encourage us as a church. And this is what he saw, what God revealed to him in a vision. And it says this, after this, I saw a vast crowd talking about uh, in heaven, too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language, meaning Chinese, Hawaiian, Haole, Portuguese, all before the throne. That's all of my ethnicities in, in me. Standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb, the Lamb referring to Jesus. They were clothed in their white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And so you see here in heaven a picture of what heaven is going to be like. You're going to have a lot of ethnicities. You're going to have people from a variety of different backgrounds and cultures. But the one thing that is uniting us is our affection and our gaze at Jesus and God forever in eternity. And so that's what God wants the church to be like. And so that's why Apostle Paul is encouraging the church to make sure that we are more united now more than ever because what he wants us to live out now is a glimpse of what we're going to be doing forever in eternity. We're going to look at these two passages of Scripture and pull out some principles that we can apply to our lives individually, but also corporately as a church. So join with me as we pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word is truth. And Lord, we pray that your truth will set people free tonight. God, we pray that you would speak in such a powerful way. Take this word general word, God, that you download it into my spirit and make it specific to every situation and circumstance for those who are listening in person and even those who are online. God, I pray that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart that's soft, open and receptive to receive everything that you want to communicate to us. Let this word that you speak to us bring internal transformation so that we can be the people, the men and women, the church that you're calling us to be united as one. We thank you for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. The title of my message tonight is this, different but not divided. Different but not divided. Uh, I'm going to have the worship team come out. And one of my favorite things to do, especially in church, is worship. How many of us enjoy worship? <laughs> love worship. I love our worship team. Our worship team is super talented. Uh, I wish I could sing. That was one of my prayers. And in heaven, I know God is going to give me Pat's voice. But he knew that he couldn't trust me with that gift here on this earth. And so he didn't give me that gift, the gift to sing. Uh, but he gave me a, a passion for music. And I just love worshiping God. There's something that happens when we worship God in song that he does something supernatural in our hearts. And, you know, when we sing corporately as a church, uh, many of us, we sing the the 
the, how would I say, what not, we sing the melody of the song, and we sing just kind of like the baseline melody of how a song is written for us to sing. But our worship team doesn't just sing the melody, they sing all different parts. There's a tenor, there's a soprano, there's an alto, there's all these different parts that they sing uh, that really creates a beautiful sound, okay? And so I'm going to give you an idea of really what this looks like. And so we're going to have Sydney, where are you at? <clears throat> You're going to sing, a, like, give us a sample of a, sp a particular song that you would sing, just kind of like in your, how you sing. We get so weak in the knees, we can hardly speak, we lose our control. Your spirit takes over us right. in a days. Your love so amazing. It's not a phase. We want you to stay with us. It's pretty good. Just give a hand for Sydney. All right. So if you and I were singing this, we would probably sing it according to how she's singing. She will set the tone and we'll try to match that, right, on our own end. But then there's other parts that you're singing the same word, but you're singing it in other parts. And so we're going to add another vocal to this, and so let's do it with two different parts and see what that sounds like. We get so weak in the knees, we can hardly speak, we lose our control. Her spirit takes over us in a day. You look so amazing, it's not a phase. We want you to stay with us. Pretty good. Was that pretty good? So you guys got to see that they're singing the same words, but there's different parts to how they're singing it. Same words, different parts. Now we're going to add a whole other, a multitude of parts together. And we're going to put these different parts together, singing the same words. And let's see what that sounds like. Let's do it together, team. We get so weak in the knees, we can hardly speak. We lose Come on, right? Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. That was me on the side, like, you know, lip singing to all of that, and like many of us were doing, right? But it's interesting how they're all singing the same words, but there's different voices, there's different ways of singing the same words that created what? A beautiful sound. And I think that's what God is trying to communicate to us when it comes to this idea of unity. That we can be different, yet we can still be united. And with the, the diversity that we bring, we can still come to a place, of, a place of unity that makes a beautiful noise and sound that God is pleased with. Because God doesn't want a world where you and I all look the same, act the same, and talk the same. Imagine a world like that, where everybody just looked and talked like you. Nobody wants to live in a world like that. That would be a really weird place for us to live. But too often we think that if a person doesn't believe the same thing as us or act the same way as us, that we can't have unity there, that we can't have relationship. And this is so far from the heart of God for you and I. And I think what they were giving us is a sample of what we're all going to sound like in heaven, where we all come from our different ethnicities and cultures, but yet we're singing one song to God himself. You know what I'm saying? And so how do we get there while we're here on this earth? Because we're on an earth that is filled with a lot of people from different cultures, different backgrounds, and a very divisive culture that you and I are living in. And here's the truth that I want to communicate to all of us. I'm going to give you the main point of my message today. And it's this, that diversity will create disagreement, but it doesn't have to create division. That we can still be united even though we're different. We can still maintain unity 
even though we see things differently and we're living in a world that doesn't know how to navigate through differences. I've heard it said from another pastor that we're living in a CPR world where many people are battling COVID-19. We're talking about the, uh, the P is the political idolatry that the world that we're living in is, where we're making a big thing out of politics and the people within politics. And the R is racial hostility. And this CPR is affecting our ability to breathe, but also affecting our ability to relate with one another. That's why we need the breath of the Holy Spirit first to come through the church so that we can figure out how to have relationships with people, even though we might see things differently. And today we see a society that are on polar opposites. We're talking about extremes on some hot topic issues. To get vaccinated or not to get vaccinated. Mandates or no mandates, right? Mask or no mask. We see people on super extremes about these issues to shut down or to open up. We have so much of these topics that's bringing division to people and we don't know how to navigate with our differences in a society like this. And we're living in a cancel culture where if you don't believe the same things that I believe in, canceled. And we see people cutting off relationships just because of a differences in beliefs. And this brings divisions into our relationships. And here's the thing about relationships. The relationships that God intends for you and I have the potential to bring transformation not only in our lives individually, but it also has the potential to bring transformation to the world corporately. That's why relationships have always been under attack since the beginning of time, back in Adam and Eve's days. The first thing that the enemy wanted to do was ruin relationships. Because he knew the power and the potential of unity within a relationship. And since then, relationships have always been under attack. And we as a church need to do our part not to give in to the schemes of the enemy, but to do our part to maintain unity in our relationships. And so tonight we're going to look at how we can maintain unity with a diversity in relationships. Because that's the world that we're living in today. God doesn't want us all to think and act alike. He wants us to be unified on a few core things about uh, our salvation and about his love for us and how we get to heaven. It's only through Christ alone. We don't work and earn our way into heaven. It's by grace through faith that we are saved. And so we're not talking about those non-negotiables, but we're talking about all the other issues that the Bible isn't specifically clear about. How do we still have relationships with people who don't think and believe the same thing as we do. And so we're going to look at how to maintain relational unity because relationships are so important. And I wish we could do an entire series on this. And tonight we're going to give you some practical handles. And I'm going to give you some things that can apply to your life. But I'm not giving you everything that would help fix all of your relationships. Because it will take more than one sermon to do that. But I want us to give some handles so that we can leave here with a pers perspective on how God wants us to navigate relational unity. So first point in your notes is this. In relationships with people who think and believe differently, we need to listen before speaking. Come on, somebody. That will preach right there. Listen before speaking. James 1.19 says this. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be what? Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Wow. That's God's word. That's truth right there. You and I, can we be honest here? We're usually slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to get angry. Can we be right, like honest in church? And so God, knowing that that's our tendency, tells us to do the exact opposite. I heard it said this way, God gave you two ears and one mouth to show you the priority and <laughs> how we need to interact with one another. He gave us through our physical design where the priority should be. And the priority is in what? Listening. Now, listening is easier said than done, right? Come on, somebody. It is. Because if we are honest, 
when we were having a conversation or in this intense discussion, let's not talk about conflict, but in intense discussion about a particular topic, can we be honest? We're not really listening to what they say. We're just waiting to respond. <laughs> this is our posture. It's like, mm, you done? You done? And we usually give them like the sass to them. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Really? And so we're just waiting. And in your mind, you're just like, you're thinking of what to say. You're not thinking of listening to what they're saying. You're thinking of, oh, let's just wait. Because I got something for you to hear. And then you hit them with the, are you done? You done? Okay, thank you. Now, here's what I have to say about this situation. And then we start telling them our piece. And you know what they're doing? They're just waiting to respond too. So we got two people not listening, just waiting to talk. And we wonder why we don't get anywhere in our conversations because conflict should lead to greater intimacy, not division. But where we see the division coming in is because we're not listening at all. We're just waiting to speak. And so God's word is telling us that if we want to do relationships well, we need to not just hear the person, we need to listen. Listen for what they're saying. And when we're listening, this is what we got to listen for. We got to listen for emotion, not just the words that they're saying. We got to listen to the emotion behind what they're saying. Because there's often way more things in the nonverbals that are being communicated beyond just the words that they're saying. And so if we're not really listening, we're going to miss out on all these cues that's going to give us insight to where they're coming from. We also need to listen with empathy, meaning this, we put ourselves in their shoes. So while they're talking, you're trying to understand where they're coming from, and so you're spending your effort not only hearing what they're saying, but trying to put yourself in their shoes in order to understand where they're coming from. And what makes it difficult for us to do this is because all of us have an internal bias. We're all prone to see and think about the world in a particular way. And this bias has been shaped by all of our experiences in life, things that we were taught, things that we've went through. And so whether you know it or not, you have an internal bias about a particular topic or situations. And so what gets triggered in conversations is your point of view on a particular situation. So you have an internal bias about that. And so before you can really listen to a person, you have to understand that you have an internal bias. And uh, this is called confirmation bias, where a lot of what we think is truth comes from our experiences. And if you don't think you have a bias, let me tell you this. Uh, all of us here get our news from different places. If I were to ask you where you get your news from, I get a guarantee in this room of this size, we won't all say that we get it from the same place. And so our confirmation bias is this. We tend to listen to what affirms our beliefs about a particular topic. We're not listening for the, like the spectrum of both sides of a deal. We're just looking for what confirms what we already believe. And so we like hitting this understanding of, see, I knew I was right. That's the internal confirmation bias. And so that affects our ability to really hear an other person. And so back in 2018, there was this uh, really sound that brought division all throughout social media. And it was a sound that was... One sound, but people were hearing two totally different things. It was this Yanny and Laurel sound back in 2018. How many of us remember this? And so I'm going to play this sound for us because if you haven't heard about it, uh, the world was literally split down the middle on what they heard. Now, this is just one sound, but from one sound, people are hearing two completely different things. So media team, can you go ahead and play this sound? Laurel. Laurel, 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 Laurel. All right, that's good. Laurel, Laurel. So I'm asking Laurel, this question. Laurel. How many of us heard Yanny? Okay. Now, for the real correct people, how many of us heard Laurel? Very few of us. And that's the thing with society. There's very few people that are actually really correct. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the real poll said this, that 47% of the people heard Yanny, and 53% uh, of the people, population, heard Laurel. Now, how can one sound, we all heard the same thing, how can one sound produce two different outcomes? 
because we have an internal bias. You and I, our brains process frequencies differently. And so if you heard one thing, it's basically you have an internal brain. Your brain is processing that sound and frequently, frequency differently. So if you heard Yanny, your brain is processing lower frequencies. But if you heard Laurel, your brain is processing higher frequencies. So this confirms that all of us have an internal bias on how we hear things. Now, the real answer, and I'm, I'm not trying to boast, but it really is Laurel. But because we hear things differently, we can be 100% sure, no, this is what you said. But we got to understand that we have some internal biases on things. And so for, in order for us to really, really hear the other person, we got to make sure that it's exactly what they're saying. That's why point number two is this. We need to seek to understand before seeking to be understood. Seek to understand before seeking to be understood. Proverbs 18.2, this will preach too. It says this, fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. So if you're the only one talking in this situation, the Bible is specifically saying you're a fool. Ouch. Tell me what you really feel, Bible. Right? And uh, in order for us, we need to understand that, you know, it takes effort to try to see the good in what the other person is saying. Even the not so good things. It takes effort for us to really understand where they're coming from. And the best way for us to get to this idea of hearing and understanding where they're coming from is to ask questions. To ask questions. Jesus, in his ministry, he asked over 307 questions all throughout scripture. He was asked 183 questions by people. But here's the funny thing. Out of those 183 questions, you know how many he answered? Three. He only gave three answers to 183 questions, yet he doubled the amount of questions that he asked, was asked. He asked twice as many questions to people. Which gives us insight into how Jesus did his ministry, but also how Jesus wants us to handle our relationships. That we should be asking more questions because more questions lead to what? More clarity, and more clarity leads to more understanding. So we should do that with people. In conversations, before you tell them what you feel, here's a good thing. From what you're saying, this is what I hear. And you repeat to them what you heard. And now they can say if that's correct or not. And if it's not correct, then they can clarify what they really mean. Because when we're listening, we usually just latch on to the things that we don't like to hear. So when we replay that to the person, they're like, no, that's not what I mean. Okay, bring clarity to what you're really saying. And when we give the opportunity for the person to bring clarity, a lot of your internal biases that you thought about the situation could possibly change. Why? Because now you're understanding where they're coming from. Here's the truth. You don't have to agree with someone to understand them. Just because you're understanding doesn't mean you have to agree with what they're saying. What they're saying could be completely wrong. But you're seeking to understand what shaped that perspective because their perspective has been shaped by their experiences. And the more you get to understand their experiences, the more you get to understand why they have that perspective. I had a friend that I've been reaching out to for a long time. Not saved yet, but definitely closer now. And in the beginning part of our relationship, this guy was very hostile about anything Christianity, about anything related to God. He knew I was a pastor, so he gave me a hard time. Like he really just got joy in making my life miserable when it comes to anything God related. And so he grew up in a Buddhist family, but it wasn't necessarily practicing. And so anytime I would bring up God, he would always give me a hard time about that. And I would get frustrated to the point I was just irritated being around him because I knew that if God came up in the conversation, he would have something to say. And it was just hard to have a relationship with someone who's just kind of, you know, making fun of your perspective. And so uh, here's one of the things that I asked him. I was like, just tell me your story. And when he started to explain to me 
his history, his experiences, it helped me to understand why believing in God was a difficult thing for him. He had a horrible relationship with his father growing up. Now, I know many of us have daddy issues, but this guy had some real hardcore daddy issues. Like he saw his dad being physically abusive to his mom. He got into physical altercations with his dad trying to protect his mom. And here's the kicker. His dad actually pointed a gun to his head and said, I want to kill you. Now, when we're talking about our heavenly father and we're talking about God being a dad, how many of us know that when you're trying to communicate that to someone who has some negative issues with their dad, this concept of God being a dad is this foreign concept to you. Like, what? God is a dad? I hate my dad. Why would I want to have a relationship with God? So the more I got to understand his story, the more I got to understand his pain. And when you understand a person's pain, you can see why they have that perspective. Right or wrong, a person's pain will give you an indication on why they believe what they believe. But here's the kicker. None of us are having conversations. Very few people are actually having conversations with other people. Once you hear the perspective, you're kind of just shutting down because they believe different. We don't take the time and effort to get to know someone. Why? Because it takes time and effort. And if we're honest with ourselves, we don't want to waste our time trying to build relationships. But it's funny. Jesus spent a lot of his time building relationships. Why? Because relationships are important. And he wanted to be a bridge builder, not a rock thrower. And so for us, we need to have conversations with people. I encourage you to have conversations with people. If a person is particularly irritating you, like you work with a negative Nancy, take them out to lunch. Nobody can get mad at you when you're buying them a meal. Come on, wait, am I, right? You might be irritated at someone if they buy you a meal, like, oh, I don't like you. I don't really like you, but thank you for the meal, right? The Bible says that a gift opens a way into a person's heart. And so have the meal and then have a conversation over the meal. And I guarantee you if you have questions and ask questions, that will change your perspective about a person. Because oftentimes what we're seeing is a manifestation of a person's pain and that's making it difficult to have a relationship with them. But we need to take time to understand where that pain is coming from. So seek to understand before seeking to be understood. Number three, preserve peace as much as possible. We've got to do our part to preserve the peace as much as possible. Romans 12, 16 to 18 says this, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. Here's the best truth right here. And don't think you know it all. This is talking to the church because the church sometimes think we know everything. And that's why people don't want to have conversations with us because we come off as a know-it-all. So the word of God is telling us, don't act like you know everything. Verse uh, 17, never pay back evil with more evil. I'll let that just settle. I don't need to go there, but let that just kind of wrestle into your hearts. Don't pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you're honorable. Here's the kicker. Do all that you can to live in peace with just the church. Do all that you can to live at peace with just your best friend. Do all that you can to live in peace with Everyone, another translation says this, uh, make, uh, as, long, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Which means this, we have to do our part to preserve peace in our relationship. So we're not as smart as we think we are. If we're coming into conversations with that know-it-all mentality, it's not going to go anywhere. And here's the truth, sometimes God allows disagreements to shape character. That's what marriage is really about. Let's just say that. Marriage is really two people that God placed in a covenant to work out some issues. And so beyond just the I do and I choose you, you're setting yourself up. God is setting you up for a lifestyle of internal transformation. That's really what marriage is all about. Three, almost three years into it. And let me tell you this, me and my wife have intense conversations <laughs> about things that don't really make any, like, 
like, all, a lot of our discussions, a lot of our discussions, okay, are about, like, when, we th- when I think about why we fought, I'm just like, what was really the issue? But you know what God is producing in that? Character. Character is being developed. You don't just pray, God, give me character, and you're like, wow, I got it. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> wow, Lord. Miracle working God, man. Jeez, one prayer, that's all it took. No, he's like, you want character? Let's get some conflict. That's, that's God's answer to character. Putting you in situations where there's conflict and allowing you in that moment to lean on the Holy Spirit, not your flesh. And when we lean on him and his Holy Spirit and walk in obedience, that's when the character is produced in our hearts. And so God often allows disagreements to shape in us character. And sometimes when the conversations are getting too heated, we can just agree to disagree. That's okay. Like you see it one way, I see it differently, potato, potato. But we can still have relationship. We don't have to throw away the relationship because we see things differently. Here's the truth of what Jesus wants to communicate to us. Jesus didn't call us to be right. He called us to be loving. I think you missed it. Jesus didn't call us to be right. He called us to be loving. Because you can be right, win the argument, and lose the relationship. And at the end of the day, in God's eyes, if you lose the relationship, that's a huge loss. That's a huge loss. And so sometimes it takes you maybe sucking it up and coming off like you are wrong in order to preserve the relationship. It's better to make a difference than trying to make a point, you know. And you can't make a difference with someone that you're not in relationship with. And so what that means for us is sometimes we just got to humbly let the other person seem like they're winning. But what you're doing is allowing God to maintain the relationship. Maintain the relationship. And so as a pastor, I've been having conversations with people all throughout this pandemic, even before. And uh, they're God-fearing people on both ends of the spectrum who are frustrated and all of us are frustrated. And one thing that I realized about just everyone who are either with the vaccination side or the non-vax, and that's just one of many issues. Uh, one thing that I realized is that people just want to be heard and have their feelings validated. <clears throat> and sometimes we don't give people the opportunity to be heard. And so we get into these conflicts because they just want to be heard. And I don't necessarily agree with a lot of people on their perspective about situations But my job as a pastor is not to tell you to get vaccinated or not to get vaccinated. My main job as a pastor and a follower of Christ is to make sure you walk in obedience. So a lot of people want us to make public statements about stuff, and we're not going to do that because that's not clear in the Bible. We focus on what the Bible is specifically clear about. And everything else, we're going to allow God to speak to you about that. And it's funny how God is allowing people on both ends of the spectrum to really Just listen to him. Because I think that's the goal at the end of the day is that we would be obedient to God rather than what we think is right. And so I want to tell you this, that we have people on our staff that are vaccinated and we have people on our staff, our church staff, that aren't. Now, how do you function as a staff when you got people on both ends of the spectrum? Here's how. You don't focus on what divides us. We focus on what unites us. (laughs) And so we can spend a lot of time just talking about why we should do this and why we shouldn't do that. And that's not going to go anywhere. Instead, we focus on what the Bible is specifically clear about. And here's what the Bible is clear about. To love God, to love people, and to make disciples. So we want to keep the main thing the main thing. And everything else that pulls us away from that, we're not going to focus on that. Not that that's less than. But it is less than compared to what God is specifically clear about. And so as a staff, we've been trying to model this. And so we're doing our best to make sure that we're leading you as a church to do the same. Let's not focus on what divides us. Let's focus on on what's really uniting us. That's a love for God, a love for people, and a love to see people come to know him. But we can't do that if we're caught up in these lesser than conversations. You know what I'm saying? So God wants us to keep the main thing, the main thing. Last point. 
Point number four is this. Be patient. Say patient. Perspectives can change over time. First Corinthians, chapter of love, 13, gives us a lot of descriptions on what love is. Let's look at what the first thing, the first description in First Corinthians chapter 13 says. Is this. Love is what? Now, they could have said a lot of different things, and they do. In this passage, there's a lot of descriptions of what love is, but the first thing is what? Patience. Love is patient and kind. So for us to really be loving, the first quality that you and I need to live out, patience. It's really hard in a society and a culture where everything is instant, though, right? Man, I waited two minutes for my McDonald's drive through <laughs> Get with it. Warming up your hot pocket. Oh, my gosh, it takes forever. You take it out with 15 seconds left. Like, you can't even wait 15 seconds. Come on. Because we're in such an instant society that society and culture is training us to live exactly opposite of what the Word of God is calling us to be. So what God's Word says is that we need to be patient. And being patient means this, that sometimes we got to give people margin to have new experiences that would change their perspective. Here's the thing that I realized about perspective. Your perspective will change over time, and even their perspective will change over time. And if you're really listening, things that you're really firm on, maybe you can really not give in, but now you can understand more where other people are coming from. And over time, you can see people's perspectives change. Now, ultimately, we got to surrender all of that to God. But when it comes to people, while we're being patient, we have to understand this truth. Is this People are never problems to be solved, but a person to be loved. So when a person believes different, we're not trying to solve that person. We're not trying to fix them. God is the only one that can do the fixing. We can't change anyone. We can't even change ourselves. So God needs to do the fixing in us. While he does the fixing in us, we're just giving them space for God to work in them as well. And here's the truth about unity. Unity becomes precious when you walk through conflict in order to reach it. That's why marriage is so great. When you're walking through conflict, it produces greater intimacy. Same principle goes through relationships. The deeper the relationships, I can guarantee you this, more conflict they went through. We want depth in relationships. You can't get depth without conflict. And so when we navigate conflict well, it allows us to get into greater intimacy and when things and people you just can't have relationships with, this is not the first thing we do, but when it's a last resort and you just can't seem to get anywhere with the person, then we got to set boundaries and agree to disagree. But that's usually the last resort. We want to make sure that we're doing all that we can to maintain the relationship. But the reality is some relationships just can't be maintained. And so we place the boundary and we place the person in God's hands and that we do our part to pray for the other pe person. And through this pandemic, uh, just be honest, man, a lot of people have left our church because they agreed to disagree on some of the things that we did as a staff. And uh, there's no, like, rule book to how to navigate as a leader through a pandemic. You can't go read a book. How to lead, a nav like, navigate through a pandemic, there's no book out there. So leaders, even government leaders, if you agree with them or not, here's what we're all doing. The best that we can. We're doing the best that we can to navigate with what we have. And nobody's making, like, decisions just to irritate people. I hope not, at least. Not here at, at ProSide. But we're doing the best that we can. And sometimes even when you're doing your best, people just agree to disagree. And there's great people that left our church just because they saw things differently. And... Here's my hope is that one day they'll come back because they're still family. And if they don't, here's the other hope that I have, that we're still part of a greater church family. We still love God. Maybe not necessarily in this family of church, but we're all part of the bigger church, and that's God's church that he's the pastor of. And so at the end of the day, if we see things differently, we just trust God with that. And that's, I know that's easier said than done. But that's the truth and the promise that we have to hold on to. And so we focus a lot on how to navigate through differences. I want to end this message with giving you an idea on everything that we're, we can agree on, like everything that we have in common. 
So here's my last point. In spite of our differences, we all have something in common. And I'm going to give you three things that no matter where you are from, no matter what background, no matter what your age, we all have this in common. Here's the first thing. Our common ground is this. We're all images. Meaning this, we're all made in the image of God. God created you and I. We're all made in his image, which means this, we're created with dignity, value, and person, um, purpose. No matter what you look like, no matter what you've done or who you voted for, you have a life and it matters because you are made in the image of God. So that's all one thing that we all have in common. Here's the second thing that we have in common. We're all infected. The Bible says this, Romans 3.23, for everyone says, say everyone, everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. So all of us were infected with this disease called sin. Jesus came to pay the penalty for our sin, to reconnect us back to God. We're all in need of a savior. And so sin is a disease of self-centeredness that causes us to see ourselves as greater than and other people as less than. And if we're not careful, this sinfulness in our hearts will bring division into our relationships. We got to remind ourselves, we're all sinners. We're all messed up. There's no one perfect here. The only one perfect was Jesus. And it's through his perfection that we have a reconnection back to God. So we're all infected, but here's the good news. Last thing is this, we're all invited. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for you and I. So Jesus paved the way to reconnect us back to God. And when we put our faith and trust in him, we have a new relationship with God. We have a new purpose in life. And now we have a new way of living that we don't have to live in a divisive world and be divided but we can be bridge builders. We can be connectors. We can have relationship with people who live differently and think differently. Why? Because the same love, the same Savior that brought salvation to us is the same Savior that the person that we disagree with needs. So that person that irritates you, they need Jesus too. And so here's the, here's the neutralizing factor. At the foot of the cross, everyone's invited, myself included. And so when I'm dealing with people who disagree, I got to remind myself, they need Jesus just as much as I do. And I need Jesus because without him, I'm nothing. And without Jesus in our lives, you and I, we are nothing. And we can't navigate through relationships if that first relationship with God isn't sealed. So how do we navigate through conflict? We need Jesus. We need his spirit alive in our heart so that we can be the men and women that he's called us to be. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this word. Simple, practical, but yet, Lord, sometimes the simplest things is the hardest one to live out. And, Lord, I know in a room of this size, God, there's just conflict. And it hurts my heart to see just marriages and families and friendships being divided over these things. And, Lord, we pray for just a, a supernatural grace, God, to come upon us to navigate these tensions, not with our feelings, but with the power and the grace that your spirit provides. And so, Lord, we pray, even now, God, that you would speak to us what we can practically do on our end, Lord, to navigate these differences, to navigate a culture that's so divisive in a way that brings glory and honor to your name. Help us to do that, God, because without you, we can't. We're sinners in need of a savior. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus, he not only covered our sins, but you give us the grace to live out the commands that you're calling us to. So we worship you today. In your beautiful name we pray. Amen and amen. And